Chautama and hello, welcome to this online webinar with Matt Rabel about J Hipster. My name is Thomas Wenger and I am co-organizer of the Chuck Talks here in Bern. Before we switch over to Matt and start his talk, let's have a look at some organizational stuff. The original plan we made a few weeks ago was that Matt would fly to Switzerland, give his talk at the Vox Zurich conference, then visit our Java user group meetups in Bern and Zurich. Finally, Matt wanted to finish his Tour de Suisse by skiing with his family in Switzerland. Apparently, our plan didn't work out because of the outbreak of the coronavirus. Within the Chuck board, we've been discussing if it's still a good idea to host our normal on-site events. The answer was no. We believe that currently on-site events with many people are not a good idea, mainly because we want to help contain the propagation of the virus so that our healthcare system is not overloaded by an uncontrolled progression. We think that we are responsible and we should do anything in order to protect especially all the people and other risk groups. So we decided to cancel the planned on-site events and in the near future do only online events. Over the weekend, we set up this webinar here and tried it out internally. Many thanks to anybody who has helped getting this right. This is the very first online event of the Java User Group Switzerland. It's new for all of us. And to be honest, for me personally, it's quite strange uh, to sit here alone in my home office instead of standing in front of you uh, in our location, the Schmiedstube. Um, by the way, in the background, you can see the brand new Chuck roll up I wanted to present today in Bern. Instead, it's standing now here in the corner of my home office. At least that gave me the chance to explain to my five-year-old boy what the roll-up is. As I said, this online format is very new for all of us. We have no great experience how to do online webinars. So please be patient if not everything works as expected. It will take some time for all of us to getting used to this new online format. Of course, you can support us by providing feedback. At the end of the webinar, you will be redirected automatically to an online feedback form. Please make use of this form and tell us what works and what we can improve. Matt and I will be connected in real time as we would be in a normal video conference, but the outgoing stream to you is first optimized and coded and buffered on the platform. So there are about 15 seconds of delay between Matt and I say something, and then you will see and hear it in your stream. Normally, this should be no problem, but this delay is the reason why Matt's and my reactions to chat messages and questions might get to you with some delay, just to know. You can chat with us and the other participants using the chat window. And as I see, there are already many uh, chat messages coming in. Thank you for that. And the webinar solution is reactive to the size of the window. This means if you are running on a desktop computer, you'll find the chat window on the right board. If you're running on a mobile device or in, in a smaller window, the chat might be at the bottom of the window. Please don't hesitate to write into the chat and get in contact with us or the other participants. Besides the chat, there is a Q&A, a question and answer tab on the right of your window. Uh, you can ask Matt questions there. If you have questions, please write it into this Q&A and not into the chat as the chat might become quite busy and confusing over time. Before you create a new question, please check if someone else already has asked the same question. If you want, you can upvote other questions. From time to time and at the end of the talk, Matt will try to answer most of your questions found in the Q&A tab.
Matt and I have the possibility to launch a poll that will show up in a special pop-up window. If that happens, please select one of the available answers. You will find the result of the polls immediately in the polls tab. So let's try this out and start a quick poll. Um, the question to you is, do you think it's appropriate to hold only online events for time being? So I have to activate that poll. Let's wait some time to get the responses in. So now we have uh, around 50 responses, 44, that means 90% mean yes, and only five, 10% say no. They want back the on-site events, maybe because of uh, some food and drinks afterwards. And I, I hope that we will uh, be able to do that uh, again soon. So thank you for that. Enough said about organizational stuff. Let's now join our speaker, Matt Rabel. Hi, Matt. Thank you, Thomas. Hello. How are you and where are you? I'm in Denver, Colorado. Seems we have a technical problem here. Matt, uh, your mic is off and uh, please shut your mic on. Sorry about that, I was on before. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, perfectly. Something strange happened uh, with me as well. I don't know what that was. Okay, but uh, everything se seems to be fine now. Okay. Okay. So, um, thank you. Um, thank you for the talk, Matt. And I think the stream is yours. Thank you. So, welcome to Microservices for the Masses with Spring Boot, J Hipster, and OAuth. And the reason that I call this microservices for the masses is because Jay Hipster makes it so easy to develop microservices that almost anyone can do it in only a matter of minutes. So let's get started. First of all, I did send a poll out on whether you use microservices or not. It looks like it's saving those and they aren't actually going. So we'll come back to that. Um, and I'll start some other polls here as well um, because we'll get to those questions, but obviously, I can't uh, get your answers in real time. So a lot of people are using Spring Boot. I know I've used Spring Boot for several years since it came out in 2014. And usually when I'm in an audience setting, I ask how many people are not using Spring Boot because usually there's most people are using Spring Boot. And so what we'll be talking about today is first of all, just what microservices are, how they kind of came to be, microservices with jhipster, how to deploy to the cloud. Uh, I used to have a part on mobile apps with jhipster, but I realized uh, that really didn't go with the microservices thing. So I'm actually gonna skip that section and then we'll go to the jhipster roadmap. So first of all, my name is Matt Rabel. I'm a hick from the sticks. I grew up in the backwoods of Montana with no electricity, no running water, and I had to walk two miles to the bus stop every day. And it felt like it was uphill both ways. I live in Denver, Colorado with my beautiful wife, Trish, and my two awesome kids, Abby and Jack. I also have a middle child. His name is Hefe. I bought him in 2004 off eBay and spent 12 years restoring him, and he's been done now for two years. Uh, part of the reason it took so long to make him look like what he does is I put a Porsche engine and transmission in him, so he's super fast and fun to drive. 
You could call them an expensive obsession. I work for Okta. My dad calls it okra, so you're you're welcome to pronounce it however you want. It actually, the word Okta means a unit of cloud measurement. So we're a cloud-based company. And if it's an eight Okta day, it means that it's very overcast. If it's a zero Okta day, it means there's not a cloud in the sky. So we do users as a software service. The acronym for that is UAS. So not a great one. I like to say user management as a software service. It's a little better because authentication as a software service isn't a very good acronym either. So at this point, I typically ask the audience what, uh, what their preferences are, but it looks like my polls aren't going through. So I'll just go ahead and, uh, and continue. And I'm going to assume that there's a few of you that are using JHipster. Everyone's probably mostly using Java 8. There's probably a few of you that might be on Java 11 or even 12 or 13. Uh, most people probably like Java, but there's five or 10 folks that like Groovy. There's probably 15 people that like Kotlin and three that like Scala. That's just a guess from past experiences. And then uh, when I ask the audience how many people are using React and Angular, at most Java places, it's half and half. So if those polls go out and we get to read those later, then uh, it'll be interesting to see those answers. And Vue, as much as it seems like it's really popular in the Java community, not so much. Um, but what I've seen is, you know, popularity is often judged by who you follow on Twitter. So if you follow the main contributors to Vue.js, chances are you'll find that it's very popular. So let's get into microservices, the history, the philosophy, and then why you should use them. So according to Wikipedia, the term microservice was first used as a common architectural style at a workshop of software architects near Venice in May 2011. In May 2012, the same group decided microservices was a more appropriate name, but really it goes all the way back to 2005 when Dr. Peter Rogers introduced the term micro web services during a presentation at Cloud Computing Expo. So this is all from, you know, Wikipedia, which in blog posts, we're not allowed to use Wikipedia, but I find it's pretty accurate most of the time. So there's also Juval Lowry had a similar precursor ideas as the next evolution of Microsoft architecture in 2007. So he said, services are composed using Unix-like pipelines and services can call services and there's complex service assemblies that are all abstracted behind URI. So that sounds very much like our microservices today. We typically have, you know, anywhere from 10 to 100, and they're all aggregated behind some sort of API gateway. And so these are some of the visionaries that came out, at least in the, in the Java space, and really um, overall. The real history is the one I just told you, but this these guys are really the ones that I think kind of made it happen. There's James Lewis up there on the top left. There's Martin Fowler and Adrian Cockroft and Joel Walms. So James Lewis presented some of his ideas in March 2012 at 33, 33rd degree in Krakow. And his talk was called Microservices Java the Unix Way. And then Adrian Cockroft worked at Netflix at the time and really pioneered uh, you know microservices at scale. And he called it fine grain SOA. And Joe Walms and everyone did as well. So um, what happened was there was an article published on Martin Fowler's blog in 2014. And what he said in there was talking about, you know, Conway's law and that how technology has traditionally been organized into different technology layers and teams follow those layers. So you have UI specialists, you have middleware specialists, you have DBAs. And then because of that, you have siloed application architectures. And Conway's law says any organization that designs a system will basically produce a system whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication system. So what that means is if you're going to work in an organization that has UI developers and back-end developers and they're all on a UI team or a back-end team or a DBA team, then it's going to be very difficult for you to develop microservices because what microservices allow you to do is do one thing and do it well. In essence, being able to take a, a concept from idea all the way to production and monitoring in production as a team. So you might have product people on that team, you might have DBAs, you might have backend people, you might have UI people, DevOps people, DevSecOps people now, and be able to actually do everything independently, not with everyone else. 
And so what Martin Fowler said in that blog post, I think is very important. And that is you shouldn't start with a microservices architecture. Instead, begin with a monolith, keep it modular and split it into microservices once the monolith becomes a problem. So this is one of the things I love about Jay Hipster is it will allow you to generate a monolith do whatever you need to do, your custom logic. And then if you did need to migrate to microservices, you could use a lot of that same logic and just put it into separate projects. So if you do have a monolith and you want to migrate to microservices, you should definitely check out Spring Boot. So it's one of the best ways that I've seen to develop Java server-based applications. There's some other ones that are coming out now that look mighty attractive too, but with its smart defaults and auto configuration, it really kicked off the whole reinvigoration of Java on the server and allows you to create, you know, highly configurable applications that deploy easily. So I first used it in 2014. I think it was before it was even 1.0. And the project I was on, all they wanted was they were using Spring MVC and they wanted the ability to externalize the actual configuration. So Spring Boot has probably 10 different ways to do that. You know, it starts with an application.properties file or a YAML file. You can override that with environment variables. You can also just put an actual new application.properties in the directory where you start it from. So there's all kinds of different ways to do it. And that project, you know, it took us like two hours to migrate from Spring MVC to Spring Boot. And then we were using that external configuration option. So it's very nice and it worked very well. So Spring Boot 2.0 now offers two different ways of developing Spring applications. One is Spring Web Flux for non-blocking and basically doing, you know, streaming, more streaming stuff than uh, typical CRUD applications. So if you're going to do a typical CRUD application, Spring MVC will probably work better for that. If you have 500 requests per second and you really have a lot of people coming in, then the reactive stack might work better with Web Flux. So if you're going to start using Spring Boot, one of the best places is start.spring.io. As Josh Long likes to say, it's one of the happiest places a Java developer can be. And the reason for that is because you're starting something new. Or maybe you're doing a demo like I'm doing today, but chances are you're not doing any legacy work, you're not fixing a bug, and it's really a happy place to be. So this is what start.spring.io looks like. Oh wait, that's the old one. The new one looks like this. So they did a bit of adjustment and modernized it. And you can see you can choose from Maven or Gradle, Java Kotlin or Groovy, whichever version of Spring Boot you like. And then you can add the dependencies there at the bottom. Some of the cool features that they've recently added is you can explore using that control space at the bottom there and see what the pom.xml it generates for you and all the files. And so you could just you know see what the latest versions are if you wanted. And then you could also share. Clicking that share button will take all of your choices that you selected and turn it into a URL that you could send to other people or put in a blog post. And so what I'd like to do now is I'd like to show you a demo using start.spring.io, create a service registry, a gateway, and a catalog service. And then we'll create an endpoint in the catalog service, create a filtered endpoint in the gateway, and then show some failover capabilities and show Spring Security OAuth for securing all of that. So all of the code for this is in this Java microservices examples, GitHub repo here, and it's in this spring boot plus cloud. So if you go to this demo.adoc file, there's actually instructions for everything that I'll show you. And, uh, and I also create a YouTube video for it. So let's get going with that. Uh, one of the things that I decided to do rather than actually showing people me doing it all is uh, is putting it in slides because I think it's a nice way that you could you know download the PDF and you could actually copy and paste it yourself. Um, there's also a blog post that I'll give you after this, but this is basically how you create a new Eureka service from start.spring.io. You notice we're not going in a browser here. We're using HTTPy, which is similar to curl, but it has like JSON by default and nice pretty colors. And we're specifying that we're going to starter.zip endpoint specifying Java version is 11, and the artifact ID is whatever you want to name it. And then the dependencies, Cloud Eureka server, we're going to put it in a discovery service, and then we're going to expand that all as it comes out of that zip file. So that will give us a discovery service, and we're using Eureka to basically allow the microservices to talk to each other, and they'll be using just a logical name rather than their, uh, their URL or their DNS. So once you have that Eureka and discovery 
project started or downloaded, you can go in and enable Eureka server on the main Spring Boot class. And then the traditional port that people use for Eureka is 8761. So you need to set that because the default for Spring Boot is 8080. And then you'll need to say, don't register with Eureka because you don't want it to try to register with itself. And then I'm gonna create a car service. So this is a catalog service that I mentioned in the demo. We're gonna again, hit that starter.zip. The dependencies, we're gonna pull an actuator, Cloud Eureka for the client to talk to Eureka, uh, JPA, H2, data rest, that's from Spring Data, and then web, which is Spring MEC, DevTools, and Lombok. And then in that project, we'll open that up, and on the main Spring Boot class, you'll add enable discovery client, that'll allow it to talk to Eureka. And then the server port is gonna be 8090, because again, we don't want it to clash with 8080. And then the application name, that's how you're gonna communicate between microservices. So you need to specify that with spring.application.name. And then the last project we'll create is the API gateway. So this is the one that's going to filter things out on the front end and talk to that car service on the back end. So it's gonna use Cloud Eureka, Cloud Fane, and Fane is basically an HTTP client that makes it really easy to talk between microservices that use HTTP. We use data rest, web, cloud Hystrix for doing failover capabilities and Lombok as well. And the reason we're using Lombok is just so we don't have to write getters and setters. Uh, with Java records coming in 14, you know, I could see Lombok going away. Enable discovery client, you'll need that on the API gateway again. And then in the spring application name, you'll need to specify API gateway. You'll notice we aren't actually specifying the server.port here because 8080 is a default and that's good enough because it's not gonna clash with any of the other ones. And so then in the car service, what we'll build is a simple entity called car, and it has a long of ID and a name that can't be null. And those Lombok uh, data and no arcs constructors, you know, handle creating the two string and getters and setters. And then we'll create an interface for Spring Data JPA for the JPA repository, and we'll annotate it with repository rest resource. So that is an example of an anemic domain model when we take our entities and we expose them right on the web. So don't do this in production, it's great for demos. And then I wanna populate that service when my app starts up. So this is again in the car service. We'll create a bean that's an application runner and we'll just stream a bunch of nice cars in there and we'll stream a couple not so nice cars in there. We'll save them and then we'll print them out. And then in the gateway, we have to add a few annotations, enable Fane clients, enable circuit breaker, enable discovery client, and those will allow us to talk to the service registry and also do the failover and use Fane to talk to our backend service. So then we'll also create a data class that just has a name. So we're not really concerned with the ID at this point because we don't really have a client that would modify it. And then the Fane client is just an interface. So you can see using that annotation, it makes it very easy to actually talk from one microservice to the other. So we're talking to the car service, that's the logical name. And we're gonna have just a get mapping for it to talk to that car's endpoint. And the cross origin annotation is if we had an Angular React client for this gateway, we could use it and it would allow us to talk to this from a different port. And then we're just gonna stream in that collection model of cars and read them. So, you know, five lines of code to make it very easy to talk to a different microservice. So now what I'd like to develop is a cool car controller. So what this is gonna do is talk to that car service, get the cars, and then filter out the ones that aren't so cool because, you know, it's, uh, it's more fun to drive the fast ones. So this is just the beginning where we have a REST controller. We pull in that Fane client, that car client, and then we go ahead and in the good cars method, we take that car client, we read the cars, we get the content, we stream it, we filter out whether they're cool or not, and then we collect them and return them. And you'll notice there's also this Hystrix command annotation that talks to a fallback method. So that fallback method, all it does is return an empty array list. So rather than having a 500 error or something like that between microservices, it would just return an empty you know, array list, and that's a much nicer way to handle it on the client. And then the is cool just basically says, hey, the Gremlin and the Stag and the Pinto and the Yugo aren't that great. So we're gonna filter all, all those out. 
And then if you start everything with Maven, you'll see that uh, they register with Eureka. This is what uh, Eureka server looks like by default. There's an API gateway, there's that car service. And then if we access localhost uh, 8080 cool cars, there's a mistake in that title, it should just be HTTP, not HTTPS. It'll return just the cool cars. So like I said, I wrote a whole blog post on this and it secures it with Spring Security OAuth. So I wanted to show you what that looks like real quick. So there is a bit more configuration that goes in here once you add OAuth in. This is the same, pretty much the same class, but we have to add some request interceptors in for Fane and for Zool. This, one of the things I configured in the blog post that I didn't show you here is that you could go directly to the car's endpoint. So that's that's configured in Zool routes in our actual application.properties. So you can see we can go to cars and it just does a proxy to that 8090 car service and home does the same thing to that 8090 car service. So the authorization header filter is just a Zool filter. And most of this is boilerplate code, but it basically gets the access token from Spring Security and then adds it to an authorization header as a bearer token. And that allows the microservices to talk in between each other. And if we were to look at the car service, all it has is this configuration for OAuth to set up things as a resource server. And then in its application.properties, it's got the settings for the identity providers, client ID secret and issuer. And this is Okta right now, but you could use any identity provider like Google or Facebook or uh, or even GitHub. So that's that's how that works pretty much. And then, you know, from there, um, you do have to configure a couple of things to make Hystrix aware of Spring Security. So you do have to enable Fane and Hystrix and share the security context. But then everything can talk to each other and everything's nice and secure. So back to the presentation here. So now I wanna get into microservices with jhipster. Talk about what is jhipster, installing and using jhipster, and then jhipster's microservices feature, and then a little bit about progressive web apps, and then we'll go ahead and do a demo there. So jhipster started as just a simple generator. It actually started on a project that used Ant of all things. I think it was 2013, and the Java developers wanted a way to invoke Node without having to install Node, and now it doesn't use Ant anymore. It uses Maven and Gradle, but there's plugins for both of those projects that will basically download Node, install it, and then do like an NPM install. So for Java developers that don't wanna mess with Node, it handles all that for them. And that was really its bread and butter for several years. It, you know, Spring Boot, Angular, that was jhipster. And a lot of people loved it, became very popular. What it is now is more of a development platform to generate, develop, and deploy Spring Boot and Angular React and even view web applications and Spring microservices. So um, we do have Vue coming in jhipster7. It's already out there as a blueprint. You could use it today, um, but it won't be part of the main generator until jhipster7. So you can go to the main website at jhipster.tech. The reason we call it a development platform is once you've generated your project, there's so much more that you can do. You can add CI CD with most of the major providers just by running a command. You can deploy it to Heroku by running a command. You can create Docker Compose files to run everything. You can even use Kubernetes to run everything. So there's a lot of things we generate for you after the fact. And it's also got like 75% code coverage for all its tests, even the one it generates for CRUD entities. So that's pretty awesome. So inclusiveness is a thing that we're very uh, motivated to do. And you notice we have a number of different logos. We just used to have the one guy here and uh, and now we have more than that and we're looking for more contributions. So if you'd like to contribute another logo, we'll certainly take that. The goals with the project are a high performance and robust Java stack with Spring Boot. Now I will let you know that there have been, there has been a lot of work on other implementations than just Java and even other implementations in the Java space. So there's a .NET version of jhipster. There's a Node version of jhipster. There's even a Micronaut and a Quarkus uh, beta versions that are out there. So, um, you know, even though we love Spring Boot, there's other people that 
have different opinions and they would like to use something else. And it's awesome that they've been able to write those and contribute them. So we have a robust microservices architecture with jhipster registry, which is basically Eureka server. And a lot of the reasons I showed you that previous code and that previous demo was everything that we did in there is the same thing that we do in jhipster. It's just, you know, hidden by much more code that's generated. So we use Netflix OSS where we can, we use Elastic Stack and Docker. And then we have a mobile first front end with modern frameworks and a powerful workflow that basically makes it so you can just run your app and if you make changes, it'll restart itself. So on the Spring Boot side, we use DevTools for that. So if you recompile a class, it'll automatically restart and reload the Spring application context. On the front end, if you're on NPM start, it uses browser sync to make sure that everything is in sync and refreshes your browser whenever you make any file changes. The one nice thing about browser sync is you can actually have multiple browsers open, even like an iOS simulator. And anytime you make a change, it will reload all those browsers. So it's a nice little tool there. So to use jhipster, you'll install it using npm install dash g generator jhipster. And so this is one way to do it. There's also a similar to start.spring.io, we have start.jhipster.tech. So you can go and make your choices online and then download a zip that way. So you can create a new directory and CD into it. For Java developers, I find that this is probably the hardest step and it was for me in the beginning because you'll typically just expect the tool to create a directory for you and then put the project in there. Well, it uses Yeoman under the covers and Yeoman expects you to create the directory, CD into it and then run it. And so it was certainly something to get used to. We have a lot of warnings at the top of the screen now that say, hey, you're about to create in your home directory, don't do it. And then you just run it with jhipster. So when we had Yeoman less exposed, it used to be yo jhipster, which I think is a great command name. Yo, like end with jhipster, right? Yo, create me an app. I guess pretty cool. So now it's just jhipster. And if you're using oh my zsh, uh, you can actually get a plugin for jhipster. So all you have to type is jh. So microservices with jhipster, if you're using the Spring MVC version, uh, you'll have a gateway that uses Zool proxy on the front end, and that's where your, your application will set your UI code, whether it's Angular, React, or Vue, all the code for all the microservices will be on that front end. And so you will notice that that is actually not a great pattern for microservices, because what that is, is it's a monolithic front end. So we are investigating techniques of doing micro front ends, where the gateway would just have a shell and then the actual code for the other apps would come from the microservices themselves. So I am looking into that. I hope to do some prototyping here in the next month to see if we can figure that out. There's actually a new feature in Webpack 5 that says it will allow to do that. So that would be pretty neat. Uh, jhipster registry is where everything registers, just like Eureka server that you saw before. It also has Spring Cloud config in there. So all the microservices and the gateway and even the registry itself will talk to Spring Cloud config when they start up. So if you wanna configure anything for all your apps, that's where you would do it. And it's got monitoring dashboards in there as well. And then your microservices can have, you know, any database you wanna use, any language. If you wanna use Kotlin for one of those microservices, you could. And there's also jhipster console built on the Elk stack. And so we have it configured that if you're running in Docker or Kubernetes, it knows to send your log files to that console. And then it's got a bunch of dashboards in there as well. I will let you know that the Zool proxy there, I said that's for Spring MVC apps. The reason I mentioned that is because we do have support for Spring Cloud Gateway now and the microservices on the back end with Spring Webflux. And so Gateway is out there and released in 6.8.0 and the microservices can be uh, reactive as well. But the one feature that we don't have is generating entities or generating CRUD, which at one point I was like, we shouldn't even do this because Webflux isn't meant for CRUD but we went ahead and did it anyway because people like CRUD. So um, that's on the master branch right now. I didn't want to demo that today because you like to demo release code. So um, if you want to generate a reactive microservices architecture with jhipster and generate entities and everything like that, um, the next release will have that. And so here's the same version of that microservices architecture with more logos. That's about it. Um, but I do want to talk about OAuth and OpenID Connect. And the reason for that is because, first of all, I work for a company that provides it. But second of all, because what I found as a consultant was I was often working for enterprises 
where they were keeping all their users kind of in the apps. Some of them were actually doing LDAP and a little federated identity, but OpenID and OAuth really allow you to keep your users somewhere else and not worry about it, but still get that user information when you need it. So a lot of this came from back in the day with Yelp and LinkedIn, where you would sign up and at the end of that sign up flow, this is like 2005, 2006, you would be prompted for your Gmail or your Yahoo username and password, or even AOL probably back then. And people would just blindly put them in. Well, there's no guarantee that Yelp or LinkedIn didn't keep your password and check for new contacts you know, in a month. So they needed a way to make it so people didn't have to give their credentials to these services. So basically delegating authorization to them so they could still access our contacts if we gave them permission, but not actually knowing our credentials. So this is how OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect work in that same scenario, rather than having your username and password on Yelp, it'll say connect with Google, and in that place, you're the resource owner, right? You own your contacts in Google, and Yelp.com is the client or the app that you know needs access. So when you'll click on that button, it'll go to what's called an authorization server. There'll be a redirect URI in there that says come back to this app, and then you'll pass in some scopes. And then the authorization server, if you're already logged in, you won't even see a login screen, but it might request consent. You know, Do you allow Yelp to have access to your public profile and contacts? They'll come back to the app with an authorization code. They'll exchange that code with the authorization server for an access token, an ID token. And then you can use that access token to not only access the user's information, but also to talk to any resource servers like the contact server, or in our case, it would be like that car service would be the resource server. And so like I mentioned, you should never start with microservices, start with a monolith. So I wanted to give these examples out there, a jhipster6 demo that I have, it's, a, it's just a monolith, it's a blog application, and there's not only a GitHub repo for that, but there's also a YouTube video. And if you go to jhipster.tech, it's the main video there. It's about 15 minutes long and just shows me creating that blog application. And then I also wrote a book on jhipster called the jhipster mini book. And uh, I wrote an app for that called 21 points. And 21 points is something that I developed while writing the book because I found that a lot of times Spring Boot was really good at monitoring itself with the actuator, but I wasn't very good at monitoring my help with you know any tools. So I wrote 21 points to basically track my own health. So you can get 21 points in a week, and that means three points a day. And for me, I had started to do a 21 point sugar or 21 day sugar detox. That was my motivation for the book. And what I found at the end of that sugar detox was my blood pressure was great. And you know, I was doing a lot of really good things. And so uh, the 21 points is three points a day. You get a point if you eat well. For me, that's you know no sugar. You get a point if you don't drink, no alcohol, and then you get a point if you exercise. So you can get 21 points in a week. I typically try to get 15, and it definitely improves my life. So now to progressive web apps. So progressive web apps are a way to develop uh, basic HTML, CSS, JavaScript apps, but they act like mobile apps, and they have similar features. So you can install them on your mobile device or even on your desktop and they have to come from a secure origin and they have to work offline. And then there's a web app manifest that gives the client, whether that's a browser or you know something on your mobile device, uh, information about how to install that app. So it's got like a URL, it's got some titles, it's got some icons, and those are all the things you need for a progressive web app. So it also should be right a single page application or you're not gonna have to be able to store everything. So they can be installed, they look and act like a native app, distributed through the web, and they're fast because it caches a lot of stuff. And so to enable a PWA and jhipster, and the code that I'll be writing today, we're gonna have a gateway similar to what we had in the other example, and there's this code in the index.html that you just go in and uncomment, and then it'll work. So word of caution though, PWAs and, uh, and service workers in general, service workers like a proxy in the background that it can intercept requests and like cache them and stuff like that. They really create a problem that in web development we've been solving our whole life and that is getting your browser to stop caching stuff, right? When you're developing on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't want it to cache stuff. So if you enable this, it will start caching everything and can wreak havoc, especially in demos. So I'm not sure I'll, I'll show this today, but maybe. 
And then uh, to force HTTPS, you might want to do that if you're deployed to like Heroku or Cloud Foundry. This is how you would do it. It looks as for that exported proto header, and that means it's not HTTPS, and then it requires secure on it. So I wrote a blog post about that with Simon Maple, about 10 excellent ways to secure Spring Boot. That's at the bottom there. And, you know, a lot of the reasons that PWAs have really become popular is because of a talk by Alex Russell. He coined the term progressive web app. He's a part of the Chrome team. He invented Dojo. Uh, he's been around the web community for a long time. And he basically said, you know, what we found is that three seconds on a 3G connection is legitimate. Like people will like that. They'll load the site. They'll use it. Um, but this is from October 2016. He found that 53% of visits are abandoned if it takes longer than three seconds. And the same report said the average mobile site takes 19 seconds to load. And I think it's even more like 22 seconds now. So, you know, the best thing we can do is try to embrace PWAs. And a lot of the reason that we failed on mobile is because our laptops are filthy liars, right? We're using these MacBook Pros or high grade Linux machines that have 128 gigs of RAM and they really don't show that you know we're on a slow connection or that our app is fat and so your laptop is a filthy liar and invest in a phone and test with a 200 dollar phone instead and so what i'd like to do in this demo is using jhipster i'll create a gateway a store microservices app a blog microservices app i'll generate entities in the apps and on the gateway and then i'll convert the gateway to be a pwa and run everything in docker so if we open up this project here and we go to jhipster there's a demo.adoc in here, and you'll notice there's a bunch of steps. So JDL Studio is a project that we have that you can use to actually create your entities or your JDL. That's how we know we're a hip project is because we have our own domain language, jhipster domain language. And you can see here, you can create applications here, right? So this has all the questions in them. There's some other fun stuff on here, like the statistics. So you can say, okay, there's the uh, last 24 hours, you know, there was quite a few projects generated. Um, but, you know, this is like Angular versus React. And Angular is default, so it gets more. But Maven versus Gradle. Maven's more popular because it's the default. And then you can have different time scales. So those are fun. And then there's also designing entities. And this is where JDL Studio comes in. So I'm going to open this one up here. Just to show you what it looks like, you can see we have a gateway. We're using OAuth 2, we're using Postgres on our gateway. And how it works is the definition of an application has many defaults. You'll notice we're not specifying the build tool, for instance. Well, that's because Maven is a default and I'm fine with that. And then for the blog, it's a microservice, uses OAuth 2 as well, Postgres. And then we have a store down here. That's a microservice, uses MongoDB and Eureka, they all use Eureka. And then for the actual entities themselves, there's a blog with a name and a handle, a post and a tag. And then there's a product on the store. And then the relationships between them are defined by this syntax, many to one, you know, from blog to user and from post to blog, and then post to tag is many to many. Some pagination rules here. And then which microservices have which entities and then some deployment information here about you know using Docker and Kubernetes. So I have that all in this apps.jh here and I'll copy that to start. So if using ZSH, there's a cool command called take. So I already have my backup. I'm gonna move that apps back. That's if the demo fails and then I'll use take and it actually creates a directory and CDs into it, so that's kind of nice. And you can do apps.jdl or jh. Both those extensions are okay. And then what we can do is jhipster import jdl apps.jdl, and it will create all those applications, the gateway, the blog, and the store concurrently because they're not really related, and you know, go ahead and generate all their files for you. And so then we can create an aggregator POM here in the root directory, just so we can run one command on everything instead of multiple. So go ahead and create pom.xml. And you can see all it does is group those modules together and that allows me to generate a Docker container for all of them. 
instead of separately. And so the next step is to convert that gateway to be a PWA. I'm going to skip that for now. Um, but once the process finishes, we'll want to create Docker images for everything. So that's the command there. And uh, I'll actually just grab that part. And then I'm going to skip the tests because those are all going to pass. So no reason to run those. Um, you'll see back here the store is already created as well as the blog. So those have finished creating. The thing that's taking a while is the gateway. And that's because the gateway actually has, um, you know, a lot of TypeScript code in the front end. So that's that monolith UI I talked about. And so it just takes a little bit to, first of all, do NPM install, which installs millions of files, and also to do, um, you know, the compilation in TypeScript. And so I'll open up another window here. And one of the fun things I have is uh, count lines of code. So let's go into the, the gateway app and uh, see what my alias is. I think it's jhipster, jhipster. There it is. Let's see. There's a little more space there. You can see what I'm doing is I'm using a clock command count lines of code and I'm excluding node modules just to show you what's in a typical jhipster app. So we'll just look at the gateway here. So you can see most of the code is actually JSON. The reason for that is because of IETN. We're using IETN because that's the default, and it will go ahead and create not only server-side files, but client-side files for a number of different languages. So um, that's where a lot of that code comes in. TypeScript, we have 6,000 lines, and Java, we have 4,600. So that's on the gateway if we run it on one of the microservices, for instance, blog, it would be much less on the TypeScript side. No TypeScript, but still some JSON. I don't know where that JSON's coming from. There's only seven files, but yeah. All right, so we're almost done creating the projects. And a lot of times this just depends on your actual internet connection, right? Your CPU power, all that kind of stuff. And it's generating our Docker Compose files there. And then since it's created all our projects, we can go ahead and run this project to create Docker containers for everything. And so this will go through each one and basically use Jib, which is a project from Google that will take just the data in your Maven build file and actually create Docker containers from that. So this makes it so you don't have to create like Docker files and stuff. So you can see this is a, the command that spits out. This NTP here is a useful one that actually says, don't show downloading all of the jars that you get, you know, from Maven or from the internet. So if you haven't done it yet, that usually just fills up your console. So let's go back and see if anyone's answered our polls while we have some time here. So those are still saving. They never went through. Darn it. Oh, well. And this does actually rebuild, you know, the, uh, the client, even though we did NPM install it over here, we never actually built it. So that's why everything's going on here. We're using Angular. We're using Angular 9. That's new in uh, 6.8.0 of jhipster. And you'll notice it's doing compiling of each individual module. So that is something new with the Ivy compiler in Angular. And the beauty of it is it a lot of times it only does it once. So it's just incremental compilation. So after it compiles those once, then it'll just compile our application code. And it's a much faster you know, build compiler for Angular. The last time I did this took about two minutes. Taking a little longer this time, it seems like. But you know, if you wanna run and grab a beer, you got some time, maybe 30 seconds till it's done here. I think it's pretty close though. And so once it's done, what we'll do is we'll go into this Docker Compose directory, cd docker compose. And if we look at the Docker Compose file, You'll see it's got all our applications in there, right? It's got the gateway. It's got all of these configurations for our OIDC client. And we're actually using Keycloak by default. Um, so this is running in a Docker container and we're using Postgres. We have the blog and all its settings. 
And then we have the store and all its settings, as well as Key Cloak and the registry. So Key Cloak will pull its files from the Realm config that we've already configured here. And the beauty of that is that you don't have to set up any users or realms or everything. Um, it's just like if you're using JWT authentication with JHipster, they'll just have an admin admin user and a user user, which has you know not elevated privileges, and uh, that all works pretty nicely. So it's building those Docker containers here, and we're using Mongo on the store. And so you'll notice that I do have Key Cloak right here. I do have to configure that in Etsy hosts. And so you'll notice right there, if you don't do that, when you actually try to log in, it won't work. And the reason we've done that is because a lot of times when Docker containers talk to each other, it's like a Docker network and they just use logical names just like you do with you know, Eureka. And, uh, and because the browser redirects us to Keycloak, it actually puts Keycloak in the browser and so we have to actually change that here. If you were deployed to, you know, hosting provider like Heroku or, or you know, AWS using Kubernetes or even Google Cloud, then you wouldn't need to do that, obviously. So now we can run Docker Compose up, and you can do it with dash D if you want, um, but I like to just do it without. Dash D is for daemon. This way you get to see all of the processes, like, you know, with their various colors kind of start up. And then if we were to use Docker itself, Docker Desktop, you can kind of watch them start as well. So if we were to look at Keycloak, you know, that's one of the first one that needs to start up. And everything's configured, so it kind of waits for the next one to start up. So that one's starting. And then if we were to go to, for instance, the Gateway, you'll see it's starting in 30 seconds. And then if we were to look at the blog, that one hasn't started yet either. And so I could have run these, right, and built them locally, but the beauty is right now they're Docker containers and I could push them up to Docker Hub and deploy them on Google Cloud right away if I wanted. So now we're getting the microservices to start. You can see with the, the JHipster logo there. Talking to Key Cloak. And we can try the registry here. Let's see what we got. So localhost 8761, just the same we did with Eureka server. Nope. Let's see. JHipster registry here. Looks like it's starting. The one thing I will let you know, if you do try this at home, make sure and go to your preferences for Docker, resources, and bump this up because I think by default it has two CPUs and only a couple gigs of RAM. And this is starting a heck of a bunch of uh, Docker containers, sometimes even more, especially if you add Elasticsearch in. And sometimes it just won't be enough to start. So this is why I recommend you know starting with microservices or monoliths, right? Because then you don't have to start so many containers. Let's, uh, let's try this again. Still not up. Maybe the gateway's up. Gateway is up if we try to sign in. Nope. Uh, the gateway could be actually be stuck in my browser with the, from the previous demo with PWA. So let's try it over here. Localhost 8080. Right, it's not there. So like I said, PWAs can cause a problem because you think it's there, but then it's actually not. So let's see, look at the registry. That looks like it's up. So 8761. And this will automatically like redirect you, or it usually does. Um, let's see, key cloak's up, right? You see key cloak there, 9080. So now if we were to log in. comes back to our app and you can see the blog and the store is starting, but we don't actually have, you know, the gateway up yet. But this is basically Eureka server with, you know, an Angular UI instead of its default one. So you can see um, we've got the application instances that it knows about, and then also history of things that have happened when they've connected. Uh, there's also the cloud configuration, 
right? And you can see it in YAML here that's specified and, you know, as properties or as JSON. And there's also an encryption service, right? If you want to actually encrypt something here, it'll show you the values. And there's administration. So the metrics is a feature of JHipster. It uses micrometer to actually time everything. And so you can see all the different metrics it's doing. But the cool thing is not only for the registry, but you can see them for like the blog as well. And you could also see them for the store. And the gateway hasn't started, so let's look and see if that's an issue over here. Looks like it's up now. So localhost 8080, sign in. And since we're already signed into Keycloak, that's one of the beauties of OpenID Connect is we're already signed in, right? Single sign-on. So now if we were to go to the entities, we can go to the blog and we could create a new one. For instance, Matt's blog. Add right, to the admin user. Created that relationship for us, right? It has that drop down and everything. So that's pretty nice. If we want to go to products and add a new product, one of the things that's in need is toilet paper right here. So we'll bump that up to 25 bucks a roll maybe. And then, uh, you know, add an image for it because, you know, sold out in a lot of places. So that's all working, right? We have this app, we have OpenID Connect, we have the relationship, we have all the microservices working. Let's uh, let's change it to use uh, Okta because I think that's a cool demo. So we'll go ahead and create a web app on Okta, which I've already done. And uh, you need to configure this login OAuth 2 code slash OIDC as the redirect URI. And that's just something that we've put in jhipster. Spring Security has this login slash OAuth 2 slash code slash whatever. Could be Okta, could be Keycloak. They don't care what it is. But we just used OIDC since we wanted to use the same URI for both Keycloak and Okta. And then we'll have our Okta settings in Spring Cloud's config. So if we go into the Docker Compose directory, it reads everything from the central server config. So if we went into that directory, that's just how things are configured. You could configure it to read from a Git repository and all kinds of other sources as well. We'll add our Spring Security stuff there and our Okta domain is going to be my domain that I've set up. So dev.13320.octa.com. And then I have the settings in this octa.env file. So the client ID is right there. And then the client secret. There I go. It's in one of these windows. There we go. Now what we can do is back in the Docker directory, Docker compose restart. I can type. And so that'll restart them all. And because they're all configured to use Spring Cloud config, they will all, including the registry, talk to that new IDP and be able to use you know, Okta instead of Keycloak. So this really shows the power of Spring Boot more than anything because, you know, we're just overriding the variables to configure it in some other location that's, you know, central. So it's a great way to, you know, architect your uh, microservices because it's nice to be able to control your configuration from one place. And even though it takes a little while, you know, to start them up, it's very convenient once they are up. We'll first demonstrate it with 8761. Looks like the registry is almost up there. It's starting. We're using Spring 225, so we are using the latest Spring Boot release. Third time's a charm, right? There we go. So now if we signed in. Oh, 
let's try a private window because sometimes it does get messed up with different uh, access tokens, right? Because it might have been storing one from Keycloak or still had that. So uh, localhost 8761. And we'll do make sure I, that looks good. Well, you love it when the demos don't work. Well, that's, you know, let's try a different browser. I actually had this problem earlier. And uh, using a different browser works. So okay, 88 is not up. What about 8761? Get my username and password here. Meh, not my day. All right, well, Octa demo failed, but everything else worked. So we'll go back to the presentation here. So I did uh, previously configure. Uh, that gateway app to be a PWA and then ran Lighthouse on it. You can see pretty good performance, 91, um, accessibility, 95, best practices, 86, and then SEO, um, pretty good as well. So the other options for deploying jhipster to the cloud, there's a lot of them. There's Heroku, and you can just type jhipster Heroku. If you're using a monolith, obviously this is pretty easy. You'll need to have a Heroku CLI installed, and it'll prompt you. Do you want to build it locally and upload the jar, or do you want to get pushed to Heroku and then build it on Heroku? So if you're on a slow internet connection, that might be a better option. Uh, for microservices, you actually have to do everything separately. You have to deploy the jhipster registry. The cool thing is if you go to the jhipster registry GitHub site, you can actually just click on a button that says deploy to Heroku, and then you'll be deploying it to Heroku. You have to build and deploy your microservices using that jhipster Heroku command and then build and deploy your gateway as well. So there is a blog post on it at that bit.ly link there written by Julian, one of the founders of jhipster. And uh, you can certainly run microservices on uh, Heroku. On Cloud Foundry works as well, similar process. You know, you deploy them all separately. Using Elastic Container Services, you can do that. We're using our AWS Containers sub-generator. Elastic Beanstalk is supported as well as BoxFuse. And one of most people's favorites is Kubernetes. You have to build, you know, the Docker image, just like I showed with Jib. And then you can run jhipster Kubernetes if you didn't have it in your JDL. And it will prompt you for the applications you want to deploy and some other options. And then you can just run kubectl apply. And it'll actually go ahead and deploy everything to your, you know, cluster. What I found with Kubernetes is, like, jhipster is easy once you have your cluster set up, right? It's figuring out all the options to set up your cluster and we don't really tell you how to do that. Um, I do have some blog posts if you're interested in that to show you how to set up a cluster. There's a link to it at the bottom there. And it does say 2017, but I have someone that just recently commented on it saying it works with jhipster 6, so that's awesome. So the jhipster roadmap, what you learned is that, you know, don't develop microservices if you don't have to, start with a monolith. You can even use uh, asynchronous messaging to talk between your microservices. So that's a good way to do that. You know, jhipster works well. Uh, Spring Cloud is pretty nice, especially Spring Cloud Config. And Okta works when I'm not doing it live. Uh, microservices with Spring Cloud Config and jhipster. This is a blog post I wrote that shows the demo. It shows all the code that I wrote. And, uh, and you can reference that if you want to see a working version. There's also a YouTube video embedded in this, and everything works in that one. Um, I also did a Pluralsight course. It's dated, but still works. And what's next for jhipster? Spring Boot 2.2, we're already there. Um, we already have that in there. Uh, full reactive with Webflux and Spring Cloud Gateway. We have that as well. The entity generator for Webflux hasn't been released, but it probably will be in 6.9.0 or maybe even 6.8.1 or something like that. And I personally am very interested in GraphQL as a backend and micro front ends, hopefully ledger leveraging like Webpack 5 or maybe something with Spring Cloud Gateway that actually sucks in the uh, the UI from the microservices. And you could even develop the UI on those microservices without starting any of the other ones if they didn't have dependencies between them. So I think both of those will be fun projects for the remainder of the year. With any luck, you know, we're all grounded for a while, so maybe even by this summer. So I did write a book on jhipster, the jhipster mini book. It is 
Um, currently only updated but for five, but not a lot changed between JHipster 5 and 6. You can download that for free from uh, InfoQ. It's also written in ASCII Doctor, so that's a nice way to author books. If you're interested in doing that, contact me and I can point you to stuff. Um, it's 164 pages. I developed that real world app, 21 points in it. You can buy it if you want to read it, you know, dead tree version or download it for free. If you want to learn more, Spring Boots Guides, jhipster.tech or our Okta APIs at developer.okta.com. And I like to say that Stack Overflow is often the lead developer on my team. So don't be afraid to ask questions there. What we prefer on jhipster is that you post all your questions to Stack Overflow and tag them with jhipster. The whole team will get alerts. And it's probably faster than emailing any of us individually. And so we write a lot about OAuth and Spring Boot and progressive web applications, microservices, Ionic, React Native, all that on the Okta developer blog. You can follow us on Twitter at Okta Dev. I also wrote a popular blog post on React and microservices, the Spring Cloud Gateway. And a lot of what I learned from writing this post is went into implementing Spring Cloud Gateway in jhipster and so that's in the latest release you can use spring cloud gateway if you'd like so try jhipster if you're just getting started this blog post is a very simple one that just shows you how to install java 11 or 12 and actually generate a very simple app and i don't even know if it has crud and then run it and uh, that's a great way to get started so all the examples i've shown today for spring cloud gateway for spring boot and spring cloud the basic one at the beginning and jhipster are all available on GitHub. And thank you for watching today. Uh, keep in touch. Check out my website at rabeldesigns.com. Hit me up on Twitter at mrabel, and I will upload this presentation to Speaker Deck. Uh, there might be a recording produced if the quality is good. And then I put a lot of code on Okta Developer. And may the auth be with you. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, yeah very much good stuff um do you want to look uh, at the questions so yeah let's look at the q a here so the first one jhipster generates a lot of quite complex code isn't it dangerous for developers that do not know spring boot and angular if something goes wrong and they have no idea how to fix because they don't know how to generate a code yes i would agree with that i mean I came to jhipster after using Spring Boot and Angular separately for a couple of years, you know, consulting for various clients. And, uh, and I found it to be like, wow, this is much easier than me having to manually create these apps. Right. And so um, it is kind of a catch 22 that way, where I think there's a lot of developers that are like, do it all for me. But then you have, you know, right from the get go, like 10 or 15,000 lines of code that now you have to maintain and uh, they were just generated for you. So um, yeah, can be a problem. So make sure and learn the underlying frameworks. Just like if you're gonna use Hibernate, you know, make sure and no SQL because you're probably gonna need that knowledge. So the next one is from Vitor. How easy it is to change the data model that you have first defined? Um, does one need to generate all the projects again or as alternative modify all the DAO controllers, et cetera? How, how much risk can be in a complex project? Um, and it might bring the how to deal with versioning question. So um, in the beginning, I kind of treated it like my project app fuse that I had for, you know, 10 years back in the day. And we basically said, if you generate a jhipster app, like you own the code now, right? And there's no real jhipster dependencies. So all the dependencies in there are just, you know, libraries and you're responsible for keeping them up to date. Well, it became so popular that a lot of people wanted to update jhipster to the latest release and so someone wrote a upgrade generator that will allow you to actually upgrade between releases and so you know if you're on six and you want to go to 6.1 you can do that you know five to six might not work or six to seven might not work but um it, we do have a way where you can upgrade between them um some things with the data model that are pretty neat is first of all we use liquid base to populate the database and create the schema and you can also use liquid base to migrate your schema between versions. So you can have, you know, the base version that you created, and then you can add some new fields to an entity and you can use liquid base diff and it'll create a change log XML file that you can use and it will modify your schema accordingly. So that's one way to change your schema as you make changes. The other way is uh, jhipster, you can use that original JDL file you used and just change stuff 
and run jhipster again, and it'll just overwrite your old files, right? So that's that's one way to do it. So hopefully I've answered that question, especially how to deal with versioning because um, people do like to upgrade. Uh, the next one is from Mark. How do you handle all the configurations without getting lost? Ports, endpoint security. Um, you don't use microservices <laughs> because that, that's going to be a problem, right? There's a lot of configuration there. And, uh, and jhipster, if you're running it from the command line, which you can do, it'll prompt you for all those choices. And there's a little more information in there, right? It'll be like, hey, you've already created something on 8080, so you might want to create it on 8081. And that's one way to do it. But yeah, it can be a problem. Um, how safe it is to use jhipster in production? This is from Marius. Uh, what aspects should we look for? I think it's very safe. There's several companies doing it. If you go to, uh, let's see here, jhipster.tech. Down at the bottom, we have a list of companies that are using it. Is this where it is? Yeah, so full list here. You can see there's 298 companies now. I don't know if they're using this for customer-facing sites or if it's all internal, but there's definitely some big names on here. I have two applications out there. Um, there's uh, jhipsterbook.com. So this is the blog for the jhipster mini book. You can see it's actually using an older version of jhipster. I think jhipster 3, it still uses AngularJS, but there wasn't much reason to update it. But I haven't even posted a blog in you know over a year. So um, that one works great. doesn't really have any problems. Um, the other one is the 21 points application I mentioned. Um, this one's very interesting because I've had this one going for three or four years. And, uh, and this one ended up having key clashes for when you're entering new data. It is deployed to Heroku. You can see it wants me to, you know, it knows it's a progressive web app and I can install it. Um, but what I've done is I actually have a pull request that I haven't merged yet. It's on Heroku recommendation right now. It uses sequences and those sequences kind of have issues. So if you're going to be doing microservices, you're going to probably want to be using UUIDs for your, you know, things anyway for your primary keys. So that's my personal experience with production. Um, I know there's there's lots of people on the team itself um, that have deployed large microservices architectures, like hundreds of microservices, but typically they don't use like the front end stuff. And so another one from Thomas, uh, what is the typical use case for jhipster, prototype or reference tech stack demos, real productive apps? So all of the above. I think for me, um, when I first started using it, I would just generate code with it and then copy and paste that code into my existing project, right? It's Apache license. You can do that. There's no real you know, problem with that. So it was a great way to look at code and also look at the test, right? How are they testing that code and using that? Uh, prototyping, awesome for prototyping because you can generate it in about an hour or two. Um, you can change from monolith to microservices in a few more hours and uh, it really makes it you know, easy to just get something up and running. Now, um, tech stack demos, obviously it demos well um, if you don't use Okta, but it usually works with Okta. I'm surprised it didn't work today. Um, and then real productive app. I think there's several people that are doing that. We had someone at jhipsterconf last year, this couple from, uh, I think it was Venezuela. They actually rebooted their whole business and used jhipster for it and they had <laughs> driving success. So that's been pretty cool. So another one from Thomas, jhipster to me is kind of MDD, model-driven development, right? I would agree with that. Uh, can you tell us something about the problem with custom code and regeneration so that custom code is not deleted or overwritten? So we do have a pattern for that. Um, a few people in the community have identified as what they call side-by-side -side generation. So rather than overriding or modifying any jhipster classes, they will just extend them. And this is both on the server side and on the client side. And what that means is they can upgrade to a new version regenerate you know, the whole app and it doesn't touch any of their code. So we call that the side-by-side -side pattern. And I do believe that someone's working on a module or blueprint that makes that so you can select it at the beginning and then use that. So a couple of things I didn't talk about was jhipster modules. So these are like plugins that people can use to modify the behavior of jhipster and jhipster blueprints. So a module you use after you generate an app, for instance, if you wanna add multi-tenancy, there's a module out for, there for that. If you want to do a blueprint, a blueprint allows you to override the default behavior. So you'll install the blueprint beforehand. If you want to use Kotlin, for instance, instead of Java, you would use the Kotlin blueprint. 
If you want to use Vue instead of React or Angular, you'd use the Vue blueprint. And then when you create your app, it uses different code. So the next question, how friendly is jhipster with Gradle usage and including Maven Gradle plugins? So we do have Gradle support, works excellent. I try to use it a lot um, because what I found is Maven's the default, so we don't always catch the Gradle issues. Um, so that's just you know the nature of not being the default. But yeah, works with Gradle, and there's several people on the team that prefer Gradle over Maven. So next question from Vitor, does it already support OAuth with authorization code and PKCE extension? So with uh, Spring Security, we are using OAuth and we are using the most secure version of OAuth. So first of all, jhipster does support many authentication types. It supports regular session, but that's only for monoliths. It doesn't work with microservices. Um, JWT, which in that case, if you have a client, it'll be storing that access token on the client and OAuth. And how we've implemented OAuth is everything happens on the server with Spring Security. So the beauty is we're just dependent on Spring Security and they do all the heavy lifting. The client just uses regular cookies to talk to the server. And that's the most secure because it's authorization code flow on the server. And we're not even using Pixie because Pixie is a way to do it with just a client ID. And there's a code challenge that happens at the beginning and the end. Um, Spring Security just added support for that in 5.3. So we could use that with no secrets, but having a secret in there is actually more secure. Um, the other thing is we have an Ionic and we have React native modules, so you can create a client that way. And both of those, if you're using OAuth and OIDC with that, it does use Pixie by default. So Pixie stands for proof key for code exchange, and it's a way of actually generating a code. And when you first authenticate, it stores it on the server. And then when you actually go back with that code to get an access token, it verifies that that matches. So it's like a one-time code. So is that all the questions there? Yes, I think that have been the questions <clears throat> regarding your polls. I think none of them has been started. Do you want to start them now? No, nah, it's okay. I mean, it says saving on my side and it's got like dot, 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 but I don't think I can really click and do them. So. Um, I can try it. Let's start the poll. No. With me the same, saving. Well, if that's the only thing that failed, well, in the second half of my demo, we're doing pretty good. Well, there's one that went through. So there's Jay Hipster. Let's see, version of Java here. And now the questions are arriving. Right, they they finally got them to work. If I click edit and then send them. Okay. We'll do them all in backwards over order. <laughs> And then the last one is your preferred server-side language. It's kind of like Kotlin these days. I don't know if these update in real time, but it looks like if you click on that polls tab, everyone can click on open and kind of see the results. Most people aren't using yes. jhipster. Most people are on Java 8, but a surprising number is on Java 11, so that's awesome. A lot of people like Angular, I think, makes sense for a lot of Java developers using Spring Boot, yep. And most people are using microservices. And then Java's winning. All right. Mm -hmm. Oh, we got some JSF usage Okay. In there. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, how was it for you, this webinar? It worked well. I mean, the, the software works pretty nice. It does give me this thing at the top that says my network is unstable, but as long as you can still hear me, I guess it's not really. 
Yeah, th there were some hiccups, but most of the time it worked quite well. It seems that we had some technical problems, especially at the beginning of the webinar. Uh, some had to restart the webinar and we will have a look into that. But for the first time, uh, it's, it's not very bad how it went. Um, thank you very much. And you will get this little tool here. All right. It's the Chuck multi-tool, which is basically a Swiss army knife on steroids. It has quite many functions, as you see. That's you will great. get one of these soon. So thank you very much, Matt. Thank you. And uh, let me switch back to my slides. Uh, we skipped that one. That would uh, have been the introduction. But um, the next online event will be tomorrow with you again at uh, six o'clock in the evening, Central European time. Um, you can still uh, apply registrations at chuck.ch. Um, Matt will talk about full stack reactive with React and Spring Webflux. And a big thanks to Matt, of course, from Okta, our participants, our Chuck sponsors, and the supporting staff in the background. There's Ursula Buri and Markus Firo. Uh, thank you very much. So I think that's it. Please give us feedback. Uh, the feedback form will open automatically at the end of the webinar, or you can send uh, feedback by email at info at chuck.ch if you want, or at the end of the webinar, as uh, I have said, um, the online form should uh, appear automatically. So thank you very much, Matt. Thanks uh, to you, the audience, and Hope to see you soon. Stay healthy. Bye, Matt. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Goodbye.